Abba, we declare hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise. Praise the Lord. We thank you, Abba, for all that you do for us. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. We thank you in advance for what you are going to do. And we declare hallelujah. Hallelujah. Adonai. Lord, as we turn to your word, let us be able to receive from your word. Let it open up into our hearts. Let us understand what you are saying to us. And help us, Lord, with all of this, be able to live out your word. Not just hear it, but live it out. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon, for those beautiful, beautiful songs and words. I heard someone who went to a uh, saying how they went to the city. They didn't know anybody and they wanted to connect with believers and they felt the best way to do it, and which turned out to be the best way, was went into a busy intersection in the town and uh, he, he didn't speak much of the language, but he was able to declare out a couple of times, hallelujah, hallelujah. And uh, all of a sudden people started gathering around him and he met a bunch of people who believed in that city. So if you ever lost somewhere, go to a street corner and shout out hallelujah and see who responds. We've begun a new uh, series of messages called Making Our Case for Yeshua the Messiah. And we're looking at the reasons why we believe that Yeshua is our promised Messiah of Israel. And we are we're hearing te uh, testimonies over the time and studying Messianic prophecies and answering common, common Jewish objections to believing that Yeshua is Messiah. Throughout the pages of Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, there's predictions of prophecies about the coming of a saviour, a promised one, who would reverse the effects of sin of humanity and reveal God's uh, program of redemption for Israel and even, indeed, of all nations, the whole world, bringing Jew and Gentile to become one in Messiah. These Messianic prophecies are like identifying credentials of the Messiah so that we can tell who he is. Sometimes they're explicit, sometimes they're implicit. Bringing it out so we can understand who uh, the real Messiah is out of all the wannabe messiahs in history, uh, even to this world today. Of course, we as Messianic Jews believe that Yeshua is the promised Messiah. And he was revealed to us and he came to us just as Moses and the prophets uh, wrote about. Our testament is the same as even in those early days, 2,000 years ago, with the first disciples of Yeshua. One of them, Philip, found his best friend Nathaniel and said to him, we found the one that Moses and the Torah and also the prophets wrote about, Yeshua of Nazareth, the son of Yosef. If Yeshua is indeed the Messiah, he must fulfill what is said about the Messiah in the Torah and the prophets and in the writings. And we're going to continue in the prophets today. And the title of our message here is that of Zechariah chapter 3. And we're starting here in verse 1. It says there, he showed me Yehoshua. And here we have uh, that uh, Zechariah is getting a vision, one of many visions that he was getting. And he showed me Yehoshua, the Kohen Haggadol, standing before the angel of Adonai with Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word which actually means accuser. So he's standing there with the accuser of the brethren, standing at his right hand to accuse him. Adonai said to the accuser, May Adonai rebuke you. May, uh, accuser, may Adonai who has made Jerusalem his choice rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick? Snatched from the fire, Yahushua was standing there before the angel and he was clothed in filthy garments. It declares that there. So Zechariah has this vision that reveals actually a heavenly courtroom scene. The accused is Yahushua, the high priest. His advocate is the angel of the Lord. Now, you've got to understand, the angel of the Lord is actually in Old Testament typology, uh, an appearance of Yeshua there in the Old Testament before of the incarnation that happened in the New Testament. And we know this is, has to be something more than just an angel because in chapter 3, verse 4, he has the power to forgive guilt and take away sins and, forgive, uh, and make someone without guilt. Only God has got the power to do that. And Yeshua, who at Adonai, he is the Lord. Yahushua's charge is that he's been dressed in filthy garments as the high priest. Then we have Satan, as I said, a Hebrew word meaning the accuser. 
and he's standing at the right hand, the place of accusation, to bring the accusation that the high priest is covered in filth. Chapter 3, verse 8 tells us that Joshua and his companions are actually a wondrous sign. They're a sign. A sign points to something. In other words, Joshua is standing there as a representation of something. In this courtroom drama, we see that Joshua represents three different peoples and groups. First of all, that of uh, uh, Israel, and then of Yeshua, and even of us. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 tells us that the accuser of the brethren stands there all night and day accusing those of us who follow after Yeshua. Jewish tradition here has Joshua's companions here as being the three that were thrown into the fire in, in uh, uh, Daniel chapter 3 which we know in English as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Yehoshua is actually part of the Zadok priesthood. But Ezekiel, the one that Ezekiel prays for being faithful in the Babylonian exile, we find that in Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezra and also uh, Haggai tells us that Yehoshua had returned to Jerusalem during the reign of King Cyrus and was trying to set up and re-establish the priesthood and the temple sacrificial system and temple worship. But life was tough. And it wasn't going right. There was many there who was opposing Joshua. And the fires of life were burning all around him. The Targum says one of the accusations is actually Joshua's sons were marrying foreign women. And the problem was they remained foreign by continually worshipping foreign pagan gods rather than the God of Israel. Now... The accuser points the finger to disqualify Yehoshua, as he's done with Israel, as he's done with Yeshua, and likely done even with you. How does he do that? Because Yeshua gets the, uh, sorry, not Yeshua, the accuser, the accuser gets us to point fingers at each other and pointing even fingers at ourselves until we are so discouraged that we quit and give up. Chapter 3 tells us that Yehoshua was standing before the angel clothed in filthy garments, and that's what the accusation was there. Now, the Hebrew here is actually extremely strong. Uh, not just filthy, but dung-covered, excrement-covered garments. Is the accuser's charge correct? Well, there certainly seems to be room to accuse Yehoshua. Yep, he's stinking up the room with his dung all right. Those dung-covered, those excrement-covered garments, absolutely there, covered. It declares it with excrement. And life is guaranteed at times to throw some fertilizer our way, as has happened with Israel, as has happened with Yeshua, all the way through. See, if Yehoshua here is convicted, then he's disqualified from his ministry of serving as Kohen HaGadol, the high priest. This charge has been laid also on history over on Israel over history, even until modern times. In ancient, is ancient Israel perfect? Is modern Israel perfect? Are the Jewish people perfect? Not at all. Just plain humanity. Israel nation today is a nation at war that the media frequently assesses as if it's a nation at peace and that they're picking on the terrorists. Israel is a complex, multicultural nation today under constant attack from the outside as well as from the inside. No other nation faces a scrutiny like that of Israel. Modern anti-Semitism is actually now considered that of anti-Zionism, anti-Israel. They say, we love the Jewish people, we just don't like Israel. Hello, the two are the one and the same. Israel faces constant charges at the United Nations to disqualify Israel from being considered a nation. Likewise, Yeshua has faced so many accusations over the years, from the false accusation for fourth Pilate over 2,000 years ago, from which came the crucifixion. Yeshua is often judged based on the horrific wrong actions that the church has done to the Jewish people over 2,000 years. Michael Brown wrote a very powerful book, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, able to get your hands on it. Our hands are stained with blood. The tragic story of the church and the Jewish people where he lays out so many and most of these horrific actions and that would have been said and done against the Jewish people. These 
horrific acts, though, were all done against Yeshua's command to love one another as I have loved you. They should not be used to discredit Yeshua as Messiah because some have done things wrongly in his name. Just like Israel of old sometimes wrecked God's reputation, we read about that in Ezekiel so often, sadly and tragically, the church has wrecked God's reputation with his own people and not shown to be the Prince of Peace as he is. If Yeshua can be convicted uh, and, and condemned, he can be disqualified from being the Messiah. Accusations against us are also designed to disqualify our ministry and our, and our callings. What's the response? What is the response? That's the main thing. Adonai says to the accuser, may Adonai rebuke you, accuser. Indeed, may Adonai, who has made Jerusalem his choice, rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? The Greek Septuagint has their burnt out from the fire. The advocate, the angel of the Lord, Yeshua, gives reason for what is going on, gives reason for those filthy, dung-covered garments. Yahashua, as a high priest, is like a burning stick that's been plucked out of the fire, that burnt-out stick. Have you ever gone camping, as I've done many times? And you have the campfire going. And you often choose one good hefty stick to use to poke things around in the fire to make sure everything's burning correctly. You work, use the stick to work the fire. And you, but you pull it out and then put that stick out of fire, out, out, put the fire out of that stick so you can use it again. That there is that stick that's plucked from the fire. Is it burnt? Yes. Is it looking all uh, uh, blackened from the fire? Yes. But it's been because that it's been used for a purpose, and that's what's been said here. Yahushua has been burnt in the fires of life there in Babylon, although honoured for doing that by Ezekiel. Now he's back in Jerusalem trying to resurrect the priesthood and the worship system. But Yahushua is having fertiliser, let's call it that, fertiliser thrown at him from all these different sources opposing him, trying to stop what he's doing, making it hard in the fires of life, burning him out. In fact, the accuser has been the one who's throwing the fertilizer and now accuses him of being covered in fertilizer. Well, guess who did it? That's why he gets the book, a rebuke. What says Adonai as the judge? The shock is that the rebuke doesn't go to the one covered in the dung, but the one who's throwing the dung. And he gives him a double rebuke here in the Hebrew to the accuser. In the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, the benchmark lexicon, the, the word rebuke actually has the context of, of, of to roar with laughter, to speak insultingly to. In other words, you've got to be joking that you're bringing this charge against my anointed. While the charge of having dung-covered garments is correct, yet the circumstances of being in that situation is like being a burnt up stick in the fires of ministry. And because of that, the charges are dismissed. They're thrown out of court. We find this happened for Israel, Amos chapter 4. In verse 11, God said of Israel, I overthrew some of you, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. But then he talks to the remainder, remainder that area. You were like a burning stick snatched out of the fire. I rescued you. I brought you out of the fire. But still you have not returned to me, says Adonai. See, Israel through history has been dirtied just trying to survive. Even modern Israel. A statement that's been said, if our enemies lose a war, they lose face. But if we lose a war, we lose our existence God has rescued Israel from the fires of life, out of Egypt, out of Babylon, over history, and even modern history, that of the Holocaust, which we remembered last week with Tisha B'Av and the other things. God has rescued from all these fires of life. And I encourage you to look at uh, um, uh, uh, Rabbi Lawrence's Shakarit service this morning where he refers to this. But Israel, sadly and tragically, has not yet returned to Adonai. We keep praying for that, that they will accept Yeshua as being Adonai's Messiah. God has chosen Jerusalem. 
He's chosen and set Yeshua as Messiah. We just need to accept that, and our people need to. Every accusation and charge against Yeshua as Messiah has got legitimate answers. They are there, out there for us to read. We're going to even refer today to one of the four book series of answering Jewish objections to Jesus by Michael Brown. There's so many other books out there. There's others encourage you to read. That of Mitch Glazer, uh, Isaiah 53 Explained. These are all available for us to read out there. So many books out there, so many videos out there. I could sit here all day long and give a plethora of answers to every objection. I can show the written evidence. We can show videos of people who have spoken about this. But folks, when is enough enough? When is enough enough? Many refuse to believe and continue their accusations against Yeshua as the Messiah. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 4. The angel of the Lord that is said to those standing in front of him, take off the filthy garments, take them off him. And then to Yehoshua, the angel of the Lord, said, See, I have taken your guilt away from you. I will clothe you with festival robes. See, Joshua wasn't the problem. It was the filth that had been thrown at him. It was the filth that now required removal. And the removal of his filth were done by the, those around him, standing before him, his friends, his supporters, and perhaps even his accusers, some of those who had thrown the dung at him. Yeshua gives a past action here. I have. I have removed your guilt. That's why we know it's Yeshua. It's not just an average angel. This is the angel of the Lord, Yeshua. He admits the wrong, but says you are forgiven. Guilt removed. You are declared as innocent. You have right standing with Adonai. Yeshua removes that guilt and sin of all humanity. And he did that on that cross long ago, 2,000 years ago. All we have to do is accept that. Then he says a future action, I will. The angel of the Lord, Yeshua, will exchange those filthy garments for that of festival robes. Empowering Yehoshua to do his ministry as the high priest. Adonai has done and will do this for Israel, for Yeshua and even for you, where you've had these things happen to you. Romans chapter 11 tells us also there about being done for Israel. All Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov, for this is my covenant with them. This is my covenant. Listen carefully. What's his covenant? When I take away their sins. And he has taken away our sins. We just need to accept that. Repent, accept, receive, and move in him as being the Messiah. Adonai's goal and desire is for all Israel to accept Yeshua's Messiah. That's his covenant with us. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 5, he says there, and a declaration to those around him, I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and gave him the fine robes, those festival robes to wear by which he could function in his office of high priest while the angel of Adonai stood by. Notice Yeshua didn't do this action. He had others do the action to, the, to Yehoshua. Exodus chapter 28 tells us the headpiece, that uh, turban aspect is, or the mitre is that last item placed on the high priest and we find this also happening in Yom, in Yom Kippur in Leviticus chapter 16. The tradition is that as Israel was leaving for exile in Babylon, the prophet Ezekiel informed the Davidic rulers and priesthood that it's suspended until someone who is worthy shall come and the crown of a king and the garments of a high priest will be given to them. Ezekiel 21 verse 30 tells us this, as for you, you profane, wicked prince of Israel, it says those words because those leaders had turned their back on God and were worshipping pagan idols instead of the God of Israel. You are due to be killed. Your day has come. At the time of final punishment, here is what Adonai Elohim says. Remove the turban 
take off the crown. In other words, remove that of priesthood, remove that of kingship. Everything has been changed. What was low will be raised up. What was high will be brought down. Ruin, ruin. I will leave it in ruin such as there's never been. And it will stay that way until the rightful ruler comes and I give it to him. So it is Adonai who's now passing on that which is priesthood, that was kingship to the rightful ruler that Adonai chooses, not that humans choose. Ezekiel's prophecies reveals that the priesthood and the kingship of Israel will be suspended until God brings forth someone who will be both king and priest. Who will that one be? Joshua's companions will be the one who put the turban on his head as being the high priest, a bit of a reinstatement. But remember, he is a sign of that reinstatement. It's to be done under the supervision of Yeshua. Yeshua's acting as redeemer here, not as the accuser. We have the choice which one we want to do, is redeem people or accuse people. Zechariah 6 we know that this turban is also upgraded to the golden headpiece of a king, to the same story. Who is this one who can be both high priest and king at that same time? Not Yehoshua. As I said, he's a sign. He represents what will happen. Yehoshua is not the one, but Yeshua comes as the rightful ruler, as prophet, priest, and king, fulfilling all three Offices and encourage you to read the other messages that Rabbi Lawrence has brought out for us. And in there he has explained this before. He is the king of Israel, but also the king of the entire world. Now it's required that Israel, the Jewish people, put that clean turban on the head of their Messiah, which is Yeshua. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8, listen, listen, Shema is the Hebrew word. Shema is the Hebrew word. We'll get that tile changed up here. All of a sudden, it decides to stop working. There we go. Back one. We'll get it. Yahushua, listen, Shema. Yahushua, the Kohen Haggadol, both you and your companions seated before you because they are men who are a sign, as I said before, the representative. For hey, look, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. He says this again in chapter 6, verse 12. Jeremiah 33, verse 15 also tells us, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the sight of the Lamb. We also read that in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse uh, 5, and Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Same thing. There's a theme that goes on in the prophets about the branch. Some translate it as a sprout, the concept of something that goes along and then comes up later at a distant time in the future, and that's what it's talking about. It's not talking about what's happening then, but it's what's going to happen in the future. It's been long debated over who this, this servant branch. Who is this one? Who is this descendant of David? Some rabbis say it refers to that of Zerubbabel, the grandson of the Davidic king Yochaniah, who was disposed by the Babylonians back there in 597 BCE. But others have looked at this over history and we find even our Jewish people have made uh, 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 an examination of this. Rabbi Ibn Ezra in the Middle Ages said, many interpreters say this branch is the Messiah. And he is called Zerubbabel. So they put it back to Zerubbabel, but then he's the Messiah. There's a tension there. But because of he is his seed, even as he is called David, David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. He's using that and quoting here from Ezekiel 37, verse 25. So again, he acknowledges that there's this interpretation that this is Messiah. And then they use it as the action is done to Zerubbabel, although that is pointing forward to the Messiah. Again, a hundred years after him, Rabbi David Kimshi says there that he claims that this is the Messiah, is Zerubbabel. But he admits that others see this as the Messiah. And he says, as, as if it was said, though I bring you this salvation, yet I will bring you a greater salvation than this. 
at the time where I bring forth my servant, the branch, because the name of the Messiah is Menachem, that is the comforter which he finds numerically is the same as the branch, doing a bit of uh, 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 um, uh, gemaric uh, 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 matching of numbering here. Also, Avram Seba in the 1400s says, the branch is Messiah. So again, we have some three main key rabbis saying the branch is Messiah. Targum Jonathan, written before all of them, says, there I bring my servant, the Messiah, so has translated and also interpreted here the branch into being Messiah, and he does that also in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. The Targum says, Behold the man, Messiah is his name. Zechariah 3, 8, This branch, Messiah, is also Adonai's servant. Who is this Messiah? Rabbi Lawrence has given many messages about the suffering servant being that of Yeshua the Messiah and encourage you to listen to them. We don't have time to go over all them right now. While some point to Zerubbabel, the clear read in the text actually says that he's a, that he's a, a sign. Yehoshua is a sign. Zerubbabel was already in office. So the verse points not to him, but to a future person, a future branch, a future Messiah. The turban and crown is placed on Yehoshua, the high priest, as a sign, not upon Zerubbabel. Again, a sign of being placed on the Messiah in the future. We we'll also find that Mike, Michael Brown, in his book here, Jewish Objections to Jesus, on page 145 of volume 3, he points out the wordplay between the longer Yehoshua and the shorter name Yeshua. And he points out there's a difference between Michael and Mike. Same name, just one longer, one shorter, shorter, but same, same. And he says there, the one and only man directly singled out in the Bible here as a symbol of the Messiah was called Yeshua in the shortened name. The Lord knew exactly what he was doing when he laid all this out in advance, giving enough clues that along the way that, once discovered, the evidence would be this indisputable. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9 also goes on. For look, the stone that I have put in front of Yehoshua, on that stone there are seven eyes. I will engrave what is to be written on it, says Adonai Tzifiot. And I will remove the guilt of this land in one day. Important, one day. When that time comes, said Adonai Tzivot, you will all invite each other to join you under your vines and your fig tree. The metaphor here, of the, uh, the, the shifting metaphor here, of the servant, the branch, the Messiah, now becomes a stone with seven eyes on it. And God will remove Israel's guilt in one day. Many see this stone now as a metaphor of the Messiah, a messianic metaphor, and the foundation stone of the temple, the capstone, the jewel in Messiah's crown, even as Messiah, the rock. This stone has got seven eyes, so we know it's a metaphor, not an actual rock that's put there. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 informs us that the atonement, Lamb of God, Yeshua, has seven eyes, and these represent the seven spirits of God. Note the use here of Adonai Tzifiot, the Lord of the armies. It's a military terminology. There's a battle going on. And we know the greatest battle of all is for the souls of our people and for the souls of this world. I will remove the guilt of this land in one day. Again, it's speaking here in the future tense. The Lord of the armies will remove the guilt of the land in just one day in the future. The question is, when does this happen? Chapter 3, verse 4, we find the angel of the Lord, Yeshua, uh, removed Yehoshua's guilt. And now Yeshua's Messiah is going to remove all guilt. How could Israel's guilt be removed in one day? Even after Yom Kippur, with the massive sacrifices that took place on that day, they get out of bed the next morning and do the same thing all over again. That one day when Messiah Yeshua was nailed to that Roman cross, that cruel Roman cross 2,000 years ago, becomes that one day. After that, 
the sacrifice no longer needed because that sacrifice done outside the city wall, not only for the Jewish people, but for the entire world. That one day has happened. The branch, the servant Messiah, is the only one who's qualified to remove the guilt of the land or our guilt in just one act. This cannot mean Israel as being the one doing this, as some try to claim. Israel cannot even remove its own guilt. How can it remove the guilt of even the entire world? That's what we find in the New Covenant there of Peter. Chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 9. In the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious and amidst those to whom it don't believe it's a stone that the builders rejected and has become the chief cornerstone though even though you rejected it's a stone that's caused people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall and tragically for 2,000 years our people have tripped over that stone and fallen they stumble because they disobey the message. What message? The message that was there in Torah, in the prophets, in the writings, that Yeshua, who et Adonai, which is also what they're destined for. But you, you, you are a chosen people, a royal peace priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Folks, in conclusion... Here we have here, as Zechariah 3 <clears throat> is a messianic vision revealing Yeshua, Yehoshua, as high priest, using him as a sign to point toward Messiah. Yehoshua was a sign, was a representative of Israel. Yeshua as Messiah and also your Messiah. Yes, he was covered with excrement, but that was from the fires of life and all the accusations thrown at him. But that guilt was removed. <clears throat> the judge threw the case out and has been set free. What about you? Have you ever felt like there's a lot of fertilizer thrown in your way in life? Have you? Sometimes it can come thick and fast. It's all designed to disqualify you, disqualify your ministry, disqualify your value. The accuser gets everybody to point the finger our way, make us quit. But the branch, Yeshua the Messiah, has removed our guilt from that cross. All we have to do is repent and receive his forgiveness. Adonai, we pray, thank you for the work that you have done. Thank you we have an advocate who can stand there, be our defense, and also be our atonement. We thank you, you've sent Yeshua as Messiah by which we can be set free. We thank you, Adonai, for what you've done. We thank you, Yeshua, for the work you did on that cross. And we want to walk in you. We pray for our people that they would. We pray for the nations that they would come and accept you as being their Messiah and say, Yeshua, who at Adonai? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon.